So it's so good to we'll, uh, get started. So on behalf of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, it's both at uh, uh, Brigham and uh, MDH in the Departments of Radiology. It is uh, my pleasure to welcome everyone to the third lecture of uh, our uh, Diversity uh, Week. And our focus this year is uh, on belonging. Uh, for today's lecture, we are uh, very fortunate to have a great lineup uh, of uh, speakers. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, today we will be uh, uh, focusing on uh, the People's uh, Heart Project. We have a, a lecture uh, by uh, Dan uh, Chande, who is the executive director of the People's Heart Project. Uh, and this will be uh, followed by an art exhibit by uh, uh, Megan Carlton, who's the artistic director of the uh, People's Heart Project. After the art exhibit, uh, we will have a moderated uh, panel uh, with uh, a number of uh, great speakers that uh, Dan uh, will be uh, moderating. Next slide. So just uh, a brief overview of uh, our uh, Diversity and Inclusion Week. Uh, as uh, you saw from uh, earlier this week, the purpose uh, of uh, uh, this programming is to recognize and celebrate the diversity of our workforce across uh, both MGH and uh, BWH uh, uh, radiology and increase uh, awareness and explore the healing power of uh, art to advance health equity in the communities uh, that we serve. Uh, next slide. Uh, for uh, anyone who's looking for CME uh, from this uh, lecture, uh, this is the uh, SMS code uh, for attendance uh, today. We'll just leave this up for uh, a minute uh, for anyone who needs to take note uh, of that. And uh, while we're uh, waiting, I just wanted to mention that uh, the talk today will be recorded and will be made uh, available for anyone who is not uh, able to uh, attend today. All right, next slide. So without further ado, I'll turn it over uh, to uh, Dr. Dan Chandi to uh, uh, kick us off. Dan. Hey, everybody. Uh, so this is a talk on using art as a tool to build empathy and health equity in our clinical spaces. Uh, so really what I want to look at is, you know, this overarching question, does the presence of one of our outpatient centers benefit the community that it's located in. I mean, obviously, you're probably going to think, oh, yes, of course it does, because it's a healthcare center and people need to be healthy. But when you look beyond that, right, does us being in a space outside of the main campus, does it actually make the lives of the people around that physical site better? So let's, let's explore. Here's MGH Chelsea. This is a nice panoramic thing I took from uh, Google uh, Street View. So the arrows, that's the little Chelsea Healthcare Center. And you, know, you pan around and you see it's kind of in this industrial complex off a little road. It's not entirely close to a residential areas, but it's not so far away. It's just kind of tucked out of the way. This is our imaging site. So, you know, it's not really part of the community, right? It's not, the people who come there are, are essentially transient. We come there, we read, we leave. We don't live in Chelsea. Much of the staff doesn't live in Chelsea necessarily. You know, what is it that we're providing for the people of Chelsea, the economy of Chelsea by having this site here? Now, here's the location. And interestingly enough, Efren did this amazing study where he helped build a rideshare program for our outpatient centers. And this were for people who had trouble getting to their appointments. They could get a rideshare ticket. Essentially, we'd, we'd pay for their Uber to go to the, to get their imaging done. And he showed that it was actually beneficial to the department because it meant fewer missed appointments, which then kind of tumbles into revenue being stable because you don't have people not making their appointments because they missed the bus or they couldn't find a ride. Now, if we look at many of the patients who actually use this service, we see that this Chelsea Healthcare Center, in effect, is used by a whole slew of people outside of Chelsea. It's from people as far as, you know, the North Shore, the South Shore, Metro West, all coming into this system. But you see considerably fewer dots in the Chelsea area itself. So just something, again, to keep in mind. Now, we also know from, you know, just being at our hospital for as long as we have, that 
you know, it, traditionally we have had an issue with uh, getting underrepresented and underserved populations to come to our hospital, right? This uh, article from the Globe in 2017, most black Bostonians don't travel the five to 10 miles from their neighborhood to come to MGH because they prefer to go to BMC or because there are, there are obstacles which prevent them from coming to us and instead kind of push them towards BMC. Now, similarly, uh, referring practitioners in the state have this concept that, you know, this is something we don't have the kind of disparities we have in school. The quality is good wherever you go. Now, I'm not saying the quality at any other hospital is poor, but I'm saying, you know, we at MGH are capable of doing something that other hospitals can't. And that's due to our access to amazing uh, doctors, amazing technologies. Us at, you know, I should say Mass General Brigham are a step above many other, even big city hospitals. So how do we kind of deal with this? Well, our goal or what our goal should be is for everyone on this call, everyone in this Zoom meeting to have a vested interest in the people of Boston and people of Massachusetts, all the people, which include the underserved populations, right? And that means, you know, paying attention to things that they think are important. Now, odds are, for probably none of the residents and probably a striking few people who are staff or attendings or technologists uh, who don't live in Roxbury know about the Molina Cass Boulevard. Molina Cass Boulevard is a strip of roadway in Roxbury that has these trees in the center. And there was this plan by the city to remove these trees. Right. And so the people of Roxbury or a, a subset of the people of Roxbury were concerned because you remove the trees, then it reduces the green space in that area, which leads to higher temperatures. Boston itself or this neighborhood is a heat island, which means it's susceptible to higher temperatures. Now you might think like, well, what like what? Why do I care? Right. What does that mean to me? Well, as a healthcare provider, this should bug you because urban heat kills people. On top of that, it leads to higher amounts of emergency room visits. And not captured in this figure is how it affects air quality. And that means asthma, childhood asthma, adult asthma, respiratory problems, COPD, right? All of this stuff kind of tumbles into these social determinants of health, meaning patients get sicker. Now, in order for you to understand, to care, right, to care about this, because this is what my goal is, is to make people care about the people around them. Uh, we have to build empathy. And this is from this great uh, lecture on building empathy, this, these four steps to empathy. It's perspective taking, staying out of judgment, recognizing emotion in other people, feeling with people. When someone says, I'm overwhelmed, it's saying, I know what that's like, and I'm here for you. Now, this is different from sympathy. Sympathy is our default response. Sympathy is born out of pity and our aversion to pain. We don't like to feel bad. We don't like to be around people feeling bad, right? So with a sympathetic response, our motivation is to fix a problem for someone. Maybe you've heard of, you know, silver lining. Uh, that's where you say at least, right? That's, that's where it all kind of comes down to. That's sympathy. At least X, Y, Z, right? I broke my foot. Well, at least you got to play the game, right? This is different from empathy. Now, empathy is a learned response, and there's a very broad field of study kind of looking into and understanding the psychological uh, attributes of empathy. But in essence, it's born from a connection to another person. I am able to see myself in you. I am able to make an emotional connection and understanding with you. And then I am able to maybe not 100% embody your perspective, 
but I can understand that your perspective is your truth. And I can understand that your perspective is important. Now in this way, an empathetic response leads someone to want to fix something with another person, right? I'm with you. What can I do to help you rather than, you know, this is how we're going to fix it. Now, this is from the uh, CW show, right? When you think about sympathy, we want to fix it for people. We want to, and, and you say like, well, we want more inclusive spaces. You start to do things like tokenism. It's not necessarily on purpose. This is a great example from the 90210 reboot, where obviously they wanted a little more diversity in their cast. So you have your token black guy. A tokenism is this over-reliance on perceived successes while ignoring underlying and systemic issues, right? This is the concept of, um, you know, oh, I have a black friend, so I can't be racist. Or, um, you know, here I use this example of having a woman on an executive board and using that as a way to dismiss claims that a company's culture is sexist, right? If you don't pair your performative diversity with meaningful change, then it's empty in the end and it's tokenism. So what our goals, so here's another good example, right? Let's jump out of the race space and let's focus in an entirely other space. Let's talk about pride. Um, if you keep up with pride over the last couple of years, you know that uh, pride being the LGBTQ celebrations, that they've become wildly popular across the world. Uh, you also may have heard of the concept of rainbow washing things, which is the concept of making something specifically for pride uh, as just kind of like a one-off, right? Like the uh, Christmas Cokes, right? You have this thing and then the next day you go back to your business as usual. So here we have Bud Light, which, you know, might not be the most appropriate uh sponsor to be waving in everyone's face when alcoholism affects the LBGTQ uh, populations at higher rates um, than other populations. Now, this was Skittles Pride campaign in 2017, which was, for the most part, strongly criticized, right? Skittles saying only the rainbow matters, only one rainbow matters during Pride, which is a true statement. But in the end, they what they did is they took all the color out of their Skittles, they took it off their packages. And people were arguing, Skittles, you're making it about yourself, right? There's no empathy there. There's just this sympathetic response. It's empty, it's hollow, it does nothing for the greater community. This is Skittles 2017. Let's jump ahead, Skittles 2021. 2021, Skittles partners with the Gay Times, Switchboard, Queer Britain, and they launched this campaign, Pride shall always, should always be full, or should always be full color. And what they did was they enlisted this company, uh, Dimachrome, and they actually went back and they colorized historic photography from some of the key moments in gay rights. And then what they did is they donated all of these to Queer Britain, who was then working to establish the UK's first national LGBTQ museum, right? So this is working with the community to develop something that the community felt was meaningful and using their resources to ensure that it happened. And they went one step further. They went to the public and they said, if you have historical photos, send them to us and we will try to colorize them as well and include them in this section. And they have these amazingly powerful moments, right? Like I love this picture of these two men in San Francisco, arm in arm, like this, you look at this and this makes you, this, this helps you develop that emotional connection. Here we see a lesbian strength march in 1985 with a famous activist and the 1971 Gay Liberation Front protest in London. There's so much here that allows you as the viewer to actually relate, assuming that you as the viewer are outside of this population. This 
these works of art, this mechanism allows you to connect with history through and make by making your own emotional connections and then attach that to something that has larger meaning and allows you to empathize. Now, uh, before we get into this uh, roundtable discussion with some amazing people, I want to show you some of this art that we have hanging up on walls. Uh, and this work is from uh, Sylvinia Mizrahi and uh, Joshua Serena's um, Poetry of Science. So uh, let me bring this up. All right, uh, I apologize to everyone to having to see my weird potato shaped body, but you know, we all got our hangups. Uh, so let me introduce this amazing panel of speakers we have. We have Joshua Serena, PhD. He's the director of the Poetry of Science Project. He's actually also a neuroscientist and a neuroscience digital content manager at MGH. He's an award-winning photographer and you know, and a crazy inventive person in his own right. We have Brooke De Giovanni Evans. Uh, she is the new director of visual arts education for the Brigham and Women's Hospital Department of Medicine and maybe all of Brigham and Women's. Uh, super happy that she's also agreed to help work with us. Um, she's the former head of gallery learning at the Boston MFA. She's a published children's book author. That's cool. <laughs> and then we have Sylvinia Mizrahi. She's just an incredible artist, uh, sculptor, painter. She's an arts educator leading multilingual tours at the Boston MFA. She's an invited artist uh, for the Boston ICA. She was listed one of the 100 most influential people for the Latino community in Boston. She is the winner of, you know, numerous awards. Uh, and I, you know, I muted her camera before, uh, and I apologize for that. 
<laughs> but you know, this I am just so excited that we all get a chance to talk. I actually want to stop sharing this because I want to see your lovely faces on my screen. <laughs> uh, there we go. Um, so yeah, it's great to see you all here. Um, I don't even really know where I want to start because I have so many questions. Um, I think first would be, I would love to jump to Josh. And Josh, um, so Poetry of Science, you brought together poets, scientists, and photographers, and use that as an opportunity to, to tell an inspirational story to the next generation. Um, how did you come to that process? How did you come to this idea? So, um, well, thank you for an amazing introduction and for inviting me in. Um, uh, the process was essentially trying to create uh, something larger than myself and to uh, a larger goal of fight systems of oppression. Um, and I saw an opportunity through the Cambridge Arts Council um, they were calling for uh, projects um, focused on racial and social justice. And uh, as a former scientist or bench scientist, I should say, and as a neuroscientist um, and as a photographer, I thought it'd be great to um, find um, poets in particular to translate the neuroscientific work um, and other sciences so that it'd be accessible to individuals who are not scientists. Um, and I worked with my partner, Lindsay uh, Covino um, Iso, who is also at Mass General as a, a communicator. She is a poet and we worked together to pair the poets with the scientists and then create poet uh, sorry, portraits uh, of the scientists, um, and then the poetry is paired with them visually. And the goal is to create an emotional response uh, in the viewer or the reader to the poetry so that they can associate the emotions uh, to the visual. And in creating this uh, positive association, um, the goal is to kind of resist uh, the negative stereotypes that are often presented in, say, media where. Um, Often people of color are portrayed in a in usually um, you know, uh, like tokenism that you mm -hmm. mentioned yourself, or um, in uh, unfortunately brutalized manners where they're physically harmed. Um, so in that sense, it represents a way to combat these larger systemic problems. Um, and it's a way for people to understand the sciences, um, and it's a way to create an association that is positive. Mm -hmm. And now when you say it's to understand the sciences, it's because the poems themselves are about the scientists and their science and what brought them to their trajectory. Yeah, so the poetry is based either on the science itself. So it could be more about the research that the scientist does. It can be about their experiences. Um, as it relates to their research or how they've come up in life. Many of the researchers have had pretty similar experiences, um, not by design, but just by um, their, the fact that they're, I think, all people of color. Um, usually they've had to overcome some pretty difficult obstacles. Um, and I think that is one of the threads that shines through in, the, in several of the poems. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the goal is to show how the complexity of the scientist and their scientific work uh, comes, or how, how they're intertwined. And I think people who are not scientists or even scientists themselves or not people of color, um, all, all these things need to play with one, mm -hmm. with one another. Now, going to the images themselves, so they were taken in the Arboretum. Uh, by the photographer who was collaborating on this project. I, I should say I am not a, an artist myself, so my understanding of uh, how of the story that art can tell is rather limited, but how does being in, so what, what was the concept with being in nature and how does that tie into this idea of um, inspiration and things not being tokenized? Yeah, I wanted to pull the scientist into nature because the scientists are there to understand and to investigate nature in the most fundamental way. 
And I wanted to also pull the scientists into the natural landscape to show that people of color are part of nature. They should be viewed with uh, and conceptualized, I think, as an inherent part of nature in and of itself, instead of, I think, taken out to these own, these very limited scenarios of either uh, violence or tokenism, for example, um, and show that, no, um, we can actually put them into different contexts and think about them or see them or visualize them in some different capacity or mentalize them in, in different and unique ways. Cool. And now, Sylvinia, um, you deal with similar concepts of representation and inspiration, but you, your work is, I think, fundamentally different in that it, it's what I would call more abstract, but I, I'm not sure if you would agree. Um, so how, how do you capture these similar concepts in your work? Well, so first, thank you. I'm really grateful to, to be today. And um, well, for me, the first thing is so hard for me that I am a visual artist. So to explain with words things that usually I my tools are lines, form, shapes, uh, <laughs> color, textures. So sometimes the words is the most difficult part. But uh, what I can say is that um, the, the, the things that they came into my work, they, it was by my experience. So definitely um, since I came to Boston, my, my practice was divided by the 20 years that I was an educator at the Museum of Fine Arts. So I had the pleasure to work with Brooke for all these years and working with the Latinos community and creating projects for the Latinos community and the importance of feel that the kids were feeling like at home at the museum. So this was really an impact for me, how different the experience is when, and with all of the visits and the visitors that we have, that they have these things of remember, I bring now my kids because my grandma was bringing me to this place. So I was feeling that I belong. So um, in terms of that, this was really an impact. And I said, even though my practice, my, my studio was divided, so, and I was doing my, my studio separate, I said, at some point, I really want to use art to communicate and to do activities, to feel that the people belong to the places and, and they have a way to express themselves. So because art is a, is a great tool for that, it's a tool that, we can embrace our difference, we can heal, we can connect, we can say the things in a, in a way that we are saying, but doesn't seem like we are saying. So, um, so in terms of my paintings, I don't think that was an intention to show something. I think I learned about my identity looking at my paintings. So I think it's an unconscious way just to, to show the, the, the things that I was living here and the immigrations and, and I was collaborating with, uh, uh, with organizations like trying to, to sell art to help the immigrants in some way. So I think that they, they for me, is a mirror. So I look at the thing, I say, oh, why I place it homes in, in my paintings? Why I place in people moving from one place to another? So it was not really like a rational things to do. And then I realized definitely, I really want to focus on doing these two things together, be able to express and also help the people feel that they belong to a place and help them express with each other. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know if it's clear, but <laughs> as no, I, I said, it it's hard across. for me to, to sometimes to explain verbally what I, I think, uh, I, I use the tools of art to, to just do it. And I noticed uh, in some of your painting, there's like little secrets and little knickknacks that kind of get like snuck in, like a little plastic toy frog or a little yeah. origami boat. Yeah. Um, it, is that from some like sense of whimsy or is there... Like what, what, what's the kind of secret idea behind that? Well, so I think the, the most amazing things about art. So I really, when I start with a painting or with the sculptures, I don't know where they will gonna go. 
it's a dialogue. You place one thing on a canvas and then this color or this shape is telling you what you can add and how they relate with each other. I love to work with recycled things, with things that they came to my house, with things from my parents' store in Argentina when I was young that they have a a kid store so they gave me all these buttons and, and and ribbons and things and I love I feel I feel that I am connected to the thing this is why I'm placing on, on the canvas but I it's not that when I start I know exactly where I will gonna end so some of the the, the flags or things they are coming in the mail and at some point they resonate to me in some ways and this is how I add it but the and then these things telling me, oh, now maybe another color or another shape. So, um, yeah, it's 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 a, it's like a game. It's like a, a moment of joy when you play with color shapes and they are telling you things if you are paying attention. So that's great. So yeah, it's, it's, it's no secret. It's, <laughs> I yeah. don't know. It's so. I want to jump in here. I'm sorry I turned my camera on a little bit late, but I'm Meg Carlton, the artistic director of the People Heart, working with Dan and these amazing um, artists and community members. And one of your pieces, Sylvina, has maps underneath. You really, you collage your work and you work in multimedia, like you're saying. And and is it Sephirad? Is that how you pronounce that? Yes, it's, it's, uh, it's Sephirad. So um, I think that the, my two identities, if I can say, they were shifting when I came to Boston. So when I was in Argentina, I grew up in, the, in a small town in the north, or north of Argentina. To be Jewish was the outsider. So it was a kind of, this was my main thing. So I was in a public school and I was the one who was different. When I came to Boston, it started to get it Latino, the kind of outsider. So it was uh, shift the, the identity from, uh, from, yeah, one, so I said, well, it, it was great here. I was, that doesn't feel it, the thing. So, and then I started digging into my, so special with this COVID, I said, my grandparents, they, from my father's side, they came to Argentina from Izmir, from Turkey. They were, they were speaking Ladino. They were from Spain. So I really wanted to, I went to these shelters of these ideas of, from where they came, that is actually our story too. So this idea of the maps, where you belong. I go to Argentina and I feel that I want to come to Boston. I am coming to Boston and I feel that I miss Argentina. What's happened to our grandparents that they took the kids from the houses 500 years ago to with the hope that they were gonna be able to come back at some point. So I think, um, yeah, these are, this uh, painting, Sephirad, is, is part of my new series about, you know, the stories of my grandparents. And, and yeah, that is the same story of us, like, moving. <laughs> and it's those symbols and those stories behind the symbols that really bring an additional layer of richness to the work. And um, our patients really appreciate that when they look at the art and they hear the story and then they make that connection. Mm. Yeah, so I think it's important. So I like to explain sometimes when they ask me, but sometimes the names of the paintings is just for a way to organize them. I really feel that this is the great about art, that everybody have a completely different experience in front of a painting. So sometimes if I place a name, so I am guiding them to think in a, in a special way, but I love the idea that this can be related with something completely different than what is my experience, because everybody is unique and they have their own point of view and all of these are valid. So I think this is a great tool in art as a tool just to say, what you think is valid, what I am thinking is valid and we can learn from each other and we can like, you know, broad our, options and, and perspective about the things. Yeah, and you're bringing up a great point that when you have a conversation with someone about the art, they share what they see in the art. Mm -hmm. So then you get to see what connections they make to their world and their experience yeah. that was brought to their mind Yeah, by being inspired by your art. Yeah, yeah, so I have so many experience from the MFA and, and even with the small kids that they are more sincere, but they, 
One, we were in front of a huge painting that was black and white. And I said, he painted with a broom. So he was not painting with a brush. And I said, I love it. How he can come with this concept that the artist was taking the broom instead of the brush to paint. So I think this is the, the amazing things about art that I, I really love. And I, I love to be able to communicate and to help others to communicate, no? to feel welcome to places where they are displaced. And, and well, the, and the idea of the big paintings and the butterflies of hope, this project is, you are part of this painting. So you can, you can place a butterfly post-it, that is the project that we were gonna do at the MGH. And you can write something that you feel about this place, about the people here, about, uh, so it's, this is in part the idea of that. And, you know, that's kind of the, this crux of empathy, right? It is the person, the audience becoming attached or seeing a link to these other people, to mm -hmm. this sense of other, which mm -hmm. they can then use to develop a connection. Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously this is something that we've been thinking about for a while, but the amount of time we've been thinking about it is dwarfed compared to the amount of time Brooke has been thinking about it. <laughs> so, you know, one thing is, you know, you obviously I'm, you have insights. Like, this is something that you've been deeply vested in for a long time. But how how can we use these spaces, our, our physical spaces in our hospitals and have these two very different methods, you know, Josh's work and Sylvania's work, which both kind of come to the same concept of togetherness and highlighting connections to people. How, how can we use our spaces to uh, facilitate this development of empathy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Well, again, thank you for having me. And Sylvina, it's so nice to see you. <laughs> I was so excited when I saw you were on the panel. Um, so, I mean, I think Sylvina said it perfectly. <laughs> like, art is a mirror and art is there for dialogue. And, and I think that's something that I've learned through my work. So I've been doing work with clinicians for um, almost 10 years now. And I come to this as an art historian um, and an educator, not an artist. And so when I was trained, it was, you know, you learned the artist's name and their background and, you know, the historical time period that all of that took place in. And then you shared that with your audience. <laughs> and um, about 10 years ago, when I started doing this work, um, it was a group of Brigham clinicians that had come into the MFA for a pilot program on skill building and to think about how art can be used um, to build skills in a completely different profession. Um, and I was just like blown away. I was like, oh my God, like I need, I need to be a part of this and, and figure out how, um, you know, how to help this grow. And, and what I've really seen over time is, is um, you know, what I had mentioned at the beginning that art generates these um, wonderful dialogues with people. It, it sort of creates a safe space. Um, you know, as Selvina said, it's, it's an opportunity to share your perspective and to hear someone else's perspective. And I think all of that helps kind of break down barriers. It helps people understand one another. Um, one thing that the, the clinicians often say to me when we're doing different exercises in the museum um, or just with art in general is it helps them to see sort of the whole patient um, and to think about the whole patient, not just what may have brought them in to the hospital or to the clinic that day. Um, and to instead kind of connect with the person's culture, background. Um, and all of that I think is, is created in these conversations around art, because when you're looking at art, there's so many different things to take in. There's the visual components, there's the thing about the artist's intention, there's, um, you know, as Selvina said, the own, your own background that you're bringing um, and sharing as you view a work of art. And so I think that that really helps kind of expand conversations for people. Now, I, I wanna use this as uh, a pitch for, creating an artist in residence spot at the hospital because I think MGB we need an artist in residence who actually gets to embed with our C-suite and kind mm -hmm. of offer their 
understanding of experiences because artists have an entirely different setup. But kind of with that concept in mind, now both Josh's and Sylvania's work are um, interactive in a sense, right? With Josh, we're, we're connecting a group of people with artists and poets. And with Sylvania's work, you know, we're allowing the audience to actively in participate with the, with the work in finishing it. Um, is there a role for like ongoing artistic experiences in the clinical space for both staff and patients? Are you saying as in creating art in a yeah. space? Yes, 100%. <laughs> so um, yeah, I mean, I love, I fully endorse the artist in residence idea. And if we can make that happen, that would be just amazing. <laughs> um, I think, well, I think it does multiple things. So um, one, and I'm not a clinician, but from my experience, you know, it, it is a very sort of cerebral profession. Like you're thinking a lot, you're reading a lot, you're researching. Um, and so by creating art, you get to take a step away from that. You get to do something with your hands. Um, and there's that kind of process piece. Um, I think it also, one of the things that I love about art either having a discussion about art or creating art um, is that it really slows you down um, and kind of helps you be more in the moment. And, and Selena and, and Joshua can speak to this um, as artists. I'm, as I said, an art historian, but, but that is sort of my experience that it really, um, it forces you to be in the moment because as Sabina said, you're, you're sort of looking for what the art is sort of telling you and, and what, um, you know, what your next step might be, your next decision might be. So, um, and it also is, you know, a lot of, of what we do, I think, um, with the doctors is very discussion based. So it's very verbal, whereas working with art, again, gives you another way to sort of connect and to share your experiences um, in a different way that's that's not verbal. So I'd love to hear Selena and Joshua's response yeah. to that too. <laughs> yeah, so Josh, you know, I'd love to start with you kind of on the same topic, but also, you know, you chose specifically to go after scientists for this first project, but I know that you have a number of other projects uh, that are also in the work of similar design. Is this something that you, is this concept of bringing together kind of written, visual, and experiential, like these three groups together? Is that that kind? Of, is that the winning combination? <laughs> um, I guess time will tell whether or not it's winning, but uh, in terms of engagement with people and dialogue. Um, I like Brooks' um, um, explanation of the dialogue, and it made me think of accessibility, not only to art, but accessibility to the piece when you're interacting with it, because I think sometimes it can be a little um, difficult to engage with the piece if you don't know how to speak about it um, or find the, the language to describe even what you're looking at or hearing. Um, but you can always feel it, which is, I think, always a good thing. Um, and then the accessibility made me think about the fact that places like Chelsea and the program for ride sharing is another form of accessibility. Um, and, you know, the concept behind my, my project, the Poetry Science and an upcoming project called Through These Realities is, um, what does it mean to approach something, uh, like approaching the art piece or, uh, trying or getting away from something, um, and, uh, I'm just going to take a step back um, to my neuroscience background, which deals with um, making associations, right? So uh, when we're afraid of something, we tend to try to go away from it or if we don't understand it. And when we love something, we tend to approach it. So part of the brain, the amygdala, deals with making associations with cues and what it's going to predict. Does this thing um, in the environment going to, is it going to harm the future and therefore I should go away from it? Or is this thing going to uh, provide something positive for me and therefore I should approach it. And um, one thing that I always have in the back of my mind is the representation of people of color in the media and the negative associations that are often along with it. And so if we're gonna build this negative association 
of people color as cues and then being something like violent um, associated with um, with people color as cues, then people are not going to approach people of color. But in projects like mine, where I'm trying to make these positive associations, these positive emotional physiological reactions um, by reading poetry and then seeing the person directly next to the poetry and making sure that the poetry is accessible so that they can understand the poetry as it relates to the science, then you start building up all these confluences of things, right? Associate the physical, yeah, associate your physical, uh, physiological um, body with understanding the science of the poetry as it's translated, with understanding, or sorry, with associating the, the visual um, person of color, right? And then that's a way to combat these, uh, these contrasting views of I want to approach or I want to get away from, right? So I think there's a, there's a kind of like this contrast and dialogue there. Um, so I, I do like to pull together all these different sensory modalities, like uh, the visual, the written, and uh, the conceptual, uh, which, which broke it down. Mm -hmm. You know, and this this also actually brings up a really interesting thing now that uh, we're recalling that you have this neuroscience background in this space. There is this concept of, you know, some hospitals have these signs, we don't tolerate racism here, right? That sounds like a very negative approach, while what you're arguing for is a positive approach. Is there something in your training that would say one is more powerful than the other or one tends to be ideal? Yeah, so I think in, you know, I studied uh, Pavlovian conditioning, right? So just how things associate to one another. Um, you're always gonna uh, compete associations. So you have something that associates with something else. You can't undo the association. You just like, create a new association that you want. So instead of trying to break it, which is not possible, you just have to create a competing narrative. And this is also true when you're creating things in, in the media. So if you um, want to uh, have people understand that, say, um, vaccines are good for you, you can't just say, <laughs> you can't try to break the negative association between those two things. You just have to constantly assert that they are good, not that you're understanding it wrong. So you have to assert the thing that is actually correct. Um, so if you say we don't tolerate racism, it's 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 like a, you're you're positing a negative. So if that's just that's a positive. Okay. And then I hear uh, Meg, you have uh, patient uh, feedback that was given for Josh's exhibits yesterday. Right, and, and this goes along with the question that's in the chat right now. So saying, what types of feedback have you received from community groups regarding perceptions of medical centers after the installation of these exhibits? So it's the percept, there, there are different, we're impacting um, layers. So people are perceiving the institution differently. Um, we have the anecdotal evidence when people walk by and we're hanging the shows. Uh, we had one individual say, wow, I've never seen people who look like me on these walls. Have you ever seen this before? I've, I've never seen this and I've worked here for years. Um, and so we've got that, that message from when we're hanging. And then that individual actually posted that her perception of the, uh, her appreciation of the exhibit onto LinkedIn and shared that in the digital world too. And um, so really just highlighting how important it was to, to see this new exhibit. Um, and then to uh, Josh's Poetry of Science exhibit and Sylvina's exhibit, when I'm hanging the artwork in the waiting rooms, I'm talking to staff and I'm talking to patients and people are people are just sharing their perceptions with me the whole time and and many of our staff and patients are people of color and and they are so appreciative to see this new artwork and say wow look at this look at this going up um you know it 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 makes the waiting rooms and it makes the the place of work feel more welcoming and it makes people feel like they belong and um, 
And then also for the, how do we make art accessible? Because sometimes people think that art isn't accessible. It has to be in a museum or, or it's too fancy or I don't understand it because I'm not an artist and I'm not an art connoisseur. So, so it's not accessible to me. So when we create these exhibits and we, we put the information on the website with additional additional stories about the, the art making, the art making process, how it connects to the community and how the community, how the art lives in the community as well as the hospital. It makes it, um, it makes it more accessible to people who are, who are viewing it. And um, so part of what Sylvina was mentioning earlier was that on next Tuesday, we're actually gonna have an interactive experience in the main hospital. It's across, one of her pieces is hanging across from the main gift shop, a little bit down on the left side of the wall. And we're gonna have a table there where people can think about the concepts of community, um, what brings them hope, what brings them joy, what are they thankful for? And they can write on these butterfly post-it notes that Sylvina has, and they'll be able to write or draw or make their mark. And then they'll be able to add their piece to Sylvina's mixed media canvas and actually become part of the art and have a community project. Um, and also because it's 2021 and we're in a virtual world, we'll have a Zoom link available as well for those who can't come to campus, if they have access to Zoom, the Zoom link, they'll be able to participate. We'll transcribe for them and put their artwork, their piece on the wall. Um, and then one more point about, you know, um, using art to support our staff and our patients. One of my other hats is as an art therapist, and previously I've run some uh, many art therapy sessions in the Cancer Center. And uh, to Brooke's point about uh, using arts with professions that don't typically use art during their day. Um, you know, I've hosted workshops for nurses and they're busy, they have no time, but we were able to make it accessible. So we did these 15 minute art infusions for the nurses to help them with their caregiving, to help give them a boost. And so we made these little cards um, that could actually fit on the badge. And they just use collage images. Um, they chose some collage images that made them feel calm or grounded or supported and put them on their card. Maybe they added some words, maybe a mantra, um, you know, I can do this or, you know, healing, art, art is healing or people can heal. And they'd put that on their badge. And then that would be, like Josh is saying, a visual reminder about a positive association where they actually got to experience the art making and they get to take it with them throughout the day. So maybe if they touch their badge and they're going into a room and it's, it might be a stressful situation, they can find a moment of calm with their mantra card they created. Cool. You know, we could obviously talk forever, um, but I want to give Savini, Savina the last word. Uh, no, I just uh, want to add one thing that for me was great working with Megan is that also we translate everything in Spanish. And for my experience at the MFA, so sometimes we, if you want everybody also to feel welcome to the place and the only language that they speak is Spanish or another one, that's, some point I think this was really a barrier. So I'm I'm really grateful that we have also the explanation in Spanish. And the idea of the project is that everybody will gonna be able to write their hopes, uh, what they are, if they are grateful, but they were gonna be able to write it in their own uh, first language if they want. So I think this is this is a great point in trying to welcome someone to the place and feel it that they belong to the place. Great. Yeah. And, um, you know, we're ex actually exploring virtual reality or augmented reality as ways to expand the languages for everything mm -hmm. here. So that adds another dimension in the future. Um, Meg, can you tell us again when Sylvina will be on campus for that? And then when Josh's show is going up across from Coffee Central? Yes. Yeah, so Sylvina's, Sylvina's, the art experience, the community art experience will be next Tuesday and it's outside the main gift shop in, in Mass General Hospital to the left. You'll see us there and we'll be there from 11 to 1. And then uh, Josh's show is, I had it written down, so give me one minute. Josh's show is um, Tuesday, October, oh, sorry, Josh's show 
is in November. And it'll just take me a minute because I don't know where my, my note went. Josh, do you remember when it is? I believe it's November 13th through the 30th. That's it, November 13th through 30th. Just got it. And it'll be right across from Coffee Central. I like and then the I shows will rotate. Sorry, sorry, Dan, I did have it written down. But yeah. it, no, it, I'm, it, I know you did. It, it I know you did. I just asked you to do so many things on the fly. <laughs> um, but then the shows will rotate too. So one of the wonderful things about our art spaces in the Cancer Center and People's Heart is that it, they're rotating exhibits. So the artwork will, will exhibit for four to six months at a time, and then we'll keep it fresh and we'll rotate a new exhibit to our new spaces. So um Sylvina's work and soon to be Brigham we're working on getting some rails up at, at Brigham and we're so thrilled to have Brooke on the team to help make that happen all right so uh obviously like I said we could go on forever but we want to be respectful of people's time so uh Carmen why don't you hop on and tell people about uh upcoming events great <clears throat> thank you very much <clears throat> excuse me <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Carmen Alvarez, and I am the program director for MGH um, Radiology, um, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And it is such an incredible pleasure to be joined here today by this incredible panel. I mean, how lucky are we to have Dan, Meg, and everyone here who presented today um, do this incredible work. We just explored so many dimensions of art and how it can help us all heal. Um, it is especially um, important for us here at NGH and at the Brigham to bring the art to our patients and to help them heal. So thank you again. This whole entire week has been very special. We continue on with the week loan programming. Tomorrow at noon, join us to explore inclusive writing in academia. Um, this is something that is applicable to all of us and very, very important. So please join us right here on this channel tomorrow at noon. And then tomorrow evening at 7 p.m., we have something very special planned, which is a virtual art night uh, with your optional um, wine at home if you want to. Um, so we'll be joined by Harvard Art Museums, who is hosting this art night. Um, again, very, very fun, continuing on with the theme of exploring heart art um, help us heal. And on Friday, we have our very own workforce. Um, our members of the radiology departments are both BW Region and MGH join us and share their own journeys and their own experiences and how they feel they belong uh, in, this, in this department and this great institution that we work for. So again, thank you so much for joining us and we will see you the next time. Thank you all.